without being able to deliver water to farms, we wouldn't have agriculture. We wouldn't be able to grow really anything in this arid environment. In Southwest Colorado, it's all about balance in the state's most precious resource, providing enough water for farmers, fun seekers, and nature. Hey, 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 <laughs> hey, hang on, hang on. These whiptail lizards are hard to see in New Mexico's white sands. That camouflage is an evolutionary lifesaver. And the do's and don'ts of restoring monarch butterfly habitat. Don't mow that. Don't cut that. Don't spray that. <laughs> Don't make a move. A new season of This American Land is taking off. Hello and welcome to This American Land. I'm your host, Ed Arnett, and it's great to be back with you. We've got some terrific stories coming up about the conservation of America's natural resources, our landscapes, waters, and wildlife, and the people who are dedicated to conservation across the country. In our first story today, I'll take you to Western Colorado in the upper basin of the Colorado River, where it begins its long journey through the American Southwest, a region where climate change is making water an even more critically important resource that will determine the future of millions of people all the way to the Pacific Coast. There's a limited amount of water in the region, and we need to find ways to use it efficiently and share it with all who need it, including nature itself. We're in Montrose, Colorado. It's in the west-southwest part of the state, in kind of the upper Colorado River basin. The Gunnison River is one of the main tributaries of the Colorado, and we're also going to go see the Cimarron River. This is a really beautiful part of Colorado, and it's really diverse. It offers a lot of opportunities, obviously for recreation but it also is a very important agricultural area. Agriculture uses about 80% of the water in this area by diverting it from rivers into canals and ditches. And with increased demand for water, coupled with increasingly less available water, due to climate variability and warmer temperatures, improved efficiency is critical to the future of this area. Without irrigation, without diverting water from the streams, without being able to deliver water to farms, we wouldn't have agriculture. We wouldn't be able to grow really anything in this arid environment. My name is Kerry Dennison. I'm with Trout Unlimited in the Gunnison Basin. We rely almost solely on water that is delivered in the form of snow. I mean, that snow melts. We divert it from our streams, and if we're having a change in our climate, if more water is being delivered as rain, and we can't divert or store or use that water, we're seeing this downward trend in terms of supply in the entire river system. So the kind of the basic premise around irrigation efficiency is to divert the amount of water that you need so that you're not wasting water and that we can leave water in the system for other uses. Carrie, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the Silver Jack Reservoir and it's important to the Gunnison River system. This time of year, snow is melting, creeks are coming up. They're gonna capture some of that runoff, saving the reservoir for later in the summer. And then when they need it later in the summer for growing crops, they'll release that water to the creek, pick it up downstream and deliver it to the farmers. So the whole reservoir and the surrounding forest here is all public lands for anyone to use, correct? That's right, and it's a very popular spot for folks who just want to get out and enjoy western Colorado. So would this be considered low? There's a lot of bank here. It's filling. This has been a pretty wet year, so the reservoir is going to be kept lower this time of year than it might normally be. They can release more water earlier in the season and then fill the reservoir up and save that water for irrigation later in the year. So it's like water in your lawn. If you leave your sprinklers on all night, you're gonna obviously overwater. 
But if you had precision technology that says you need this amount of water, you'd be conserving water and still getting the same growth benefit. That's right. I mean, this is basically an effort to track the demand on the system back to the supply so that and there's not system loss. This is a pretty complex system. Maybe you could uh, draw it out for us. So there's three creeks that are the headwaters of the Cimarron watershed. They fill Silver Jack Reservoir, which then delivers or spills water into the Cimarron River, which flows down to the Gunnison. This will make hydropower and sustain a healthy fishery downstream. The Cimarron Canal diverts water out of the river and runs it into the canal. So obviously, this is the diversion structure. Yeah, so here's the ditch taking water down the Cimarron Canal to use it for irrigation. This is the rest of the Cimarron River. Important to realize that in a dry year like 2012, the Cimarron Canal dried up the river here, and they have the right to do that. The Bostwick Park Conservancy District have the right to take all the water in the stream if that's what's needed to fill the demands for their shareholders. So the diversion point takes water about 23 miles to the point that we're standing at now, where the water is split and sent to the irrigators on the north side of the system and the south side of the system. So all this water goes to irrigate crops, pasture land. Add this is my brother, Trey Dennison. Trey. He's the manager of the Bostwick Park and Cimarron Canal Reservoir Company. This system here is well over 100 years old, and it hasn't seen much improvement since then. So we're <laughs> scrambling we now to, to modernize it. So inside of this tube is a pressure transducer, and it senses the depth of water. It'll send a signal into this box, and it'll tell you how much water is running down this ditch. And you could manage that remotely without wasting time coming up here. Right, so we can control that you know, from our office. I can control it from my laptop. So this kind of technology gives us that real-time data so that we can watch it 24-7. You know, so this is about 100 cubic feet per second running past me right now that's going to be used to grow hay and other crops in the Montrose area. My grandfather bought this property back in the 30s, and uh, it's traditionally been used for grass, hay, and cattle pasture. I'm Kurt Sandberg. I'm a farmer rancher in Montrose, Colorado. And there's really no way that you could farm and ranch here without this diversion of water. Oh, no, no. So this is a traditional flood irrigation system. If you had the resources to improve this system, what would that look like? Well, ideally, we'd like to pipe it and put it into some kind of an irrigation system, uh, preferably sprinklers, I think, are the most efficient. Good water conservation practices on the part of landowners surrounding national park areas, I would hope is a benefit to the landowner themselves, but also it's definitely a benefit to the National Park Service. Uh, Kurt Sandberg would be a good example who has a home ranch right here in the Boswick Park area where we are right now. We want uh, clean water, we want abundant water uh, flowing into the park, and to the extent that landowners can help us achieve that goal, it, it's a really fabulous outcome. How many visitors do you see on an annual basis in the park? In Black Canyon, we see an annual visitation of approximately uh, 300,000 visitors a year, and it's growing uh, rapidly. So where are you guys from? Uh, we're from Kansas City. As far as I know, the Colorado River, it's a livelihood for the big portion of the Southwest. And, uh, and, and to preserve the, from the source all the way down, it's vitally important. Not just the scenery, but just uh, for the well-being of the nation. And the Black Canyon of the Gunnison is a world-class fishery, correct? 
It is a world-class fishery, a, a lot of uh, gold medal trout fishing along the Gunnison River through Black Canyon, and uh, you know that also is an important part of our local economy. There we go. Missed him, and then I got him back. Guest one, host zero. It's all about water. We're drinking water for municipalities. It's water for irrigation, for hydropower, but also for a world-class fly fishery, which feeds into the outdoor recreation economy. Well, I'm here with David DeGruy, the president of Mayfly Outdoors. David, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your business. Sure. We are a fly fishing company. Uh, we've been based in Montrose for about 30 years here. And how many employees do you have? We have just about 50, um, a long average tenure. And I think overall a real pride in you know the product because it's made right here in Montrose. So what does this river and the whole river system in the Colorado Basin mean to this community? It's really the cornerstone you know of our community. I think maintaining what is our only asset, we, you know our rivers, is pretty critical. It's amazing. Pretty spectacular. You know, spending some time here in the Gunnison Basin understanding these issues surrounding water use really gained a new appreciation for just how valuable of a commodity water really is. And all the different users and stakeholder groups coming together to use their innovation and creative ideas. Increased efficiency can solve water scarcity issues in a way that benefits farmers and ranchers, fish and wildlife habitat, and the tourism and recreational economies that rely on healthy rivers. Strong cooperation among water users to increase efficiency is working in this part of the Colorado River Basin, but can really work anywhere in the country as water becomes more scarce and more important in the future. It's certainly the most recognized butterfly in North America, the monarch a migratory species that can travel in four generations more than 2,000 miles from Canada to Mexico and back. During the past 20 years, monarch populations have declined dramatically because their habitat and food sources have been impacted by expansion of farmland, housing developments, and clear-cutting natural landscapes. Some farmers and ranchers are finding ways to reverse that decline, and to see how they're doing that, we go now to Oklahoma, right in the middle of the monarch's migratory pathway. Here we are at Lasseter Place is what we like to call it. It's between Davis and Sulphur, Oklahoma. My name is Bruce Reynolds and I currently rent the land. This land had been neglected for approximately at least 20 years. By that, I mean it was overgrazed. Too many cattle were running on here and allowed the, the cedars and other underbrush to kind of take over. Cedars are very invasive, but I've been working real closely with NRCS to restore this land. Our goal is to get as much native pasture, as many plant species as we can, we'd like to have. The problem with ranching cattle is that for a naturalist, they're, they're called forbs. For a rancher, they call weeds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Way to go. I'm Julie Hoffman. I am a naturalist at Lake Murray State Park and a rancher's girlfriend. <laughs> Julie and I are both very environmentally conscious. She more so than I. I always have to look at a bottom line. Uh, so it's nice to, to lease this place, but if I can't make any money on it, then I need to go spend my time doing something else. The prairie and the pasture is where I really feel connected to and at home with. I don't know if I'm really even bringing much to the table other than don't mow that, don't cut that, don't spray that. <laughs> Together we make a really good pair as far as taking care of the place and, and trying to make it productive cattle-wise as well as for the monarch butterflies and, and our bees. Um, Ecosystems our... definitely are being created. Last spring, in spring of 2016, I saw a single monarch all spring in northern Oklahoma. Just one. Wow. Yeah, it was bad. It was that sad. is bad. And, it and kind of makes year, my heart hurt a little. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I'm Ray Morans. I'm a pollinator ecologist with the Xerces Society and NRCS. Monarch conservation is a big focus of my work. Notice the leaves of this one are very wide right. and sort of rounded. This is green antelope, horn milkweed, and the other one is spider milkweed. Monarchs love them both. We could search it for eggs and uh, 
probably not going to find any, but we might. No, I'm not seeing any monarch eggs. Turns out that Oklahoma is one of the most important states for monarch biology yeah. and conservation. I was hoping they'd be on this really open one. When folks think of what a butterfly looks like, they usually think of a large orange butterfly with black stripes. They think of monarchs. Uh, they're beautiful creatures. They have a fascinating life cycle. And they're certainly uh, an important part of our natural heritage that most of us grew up with. But there are a lot fewer monarchs than there used to be. So I'm looking for other eggs. Don't see any. About seven or eight years ago, there was a migration through this place. I was driving down the county road and literally stopped because there were so many coming across. And so that, that was pretty cool to see. I'd like to see that again. I would too. Their populations are declining and something has to be done. And the alternative was we were staring at monarchs becoming an endangered species. When that occurs, if you find an endangered species on something, that just means you can't spray, you can't do wholly anything, hardly. And the monetary side says, we need to do this just so we don't get shut down completely. The other side of me says, we need to do this because it's the right thing to do. So here is the first monarch egg we found this morning. Shaped sort of like a football. Pretty soon this egg will turn dark, and then it'll turn into a tiny little caterpillar. Uh, very small, and that caterpillar will start eating this milkweed plant. These areas used to be beautiful expanses of native tall grass and mixed grass prairie. And now they've become forests of cedar trees with very low diversity. I knew that I had a problem in this place with cedars, and someone had told me that NRCS had funds available to help with that. This particular ground that we're clearing right now is part of the NRCS Monarch Project. So after we've dozed them out, the second step is we just let them dry. Next spring, around February time frame, then I can just light the match and the fuel itself, the grass will carry the flame. It'll be black. I'm Brandon Chandler with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I'm a district conservationist here in Oklahoma. What's really interesting about this place, Bruce, is you can really see your transition of progress from what you started two or three years ago. You still have areas that are still yet to go. So it's just this painted picture that you can see different stages. Yeah, it kind of gives you hope. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. able to connect with them, get five years worth of contracts for cedar eradication, and then also for the prescribed fire. And then this last go around was specifically to improve monarch habitat. I felt the responsibility is I got to give them a hotel here to at least kind of lay over a little while. That's right. And the fact that NRCS is willing to help me with that just makes it that much easier for me to go ahead and implement. It's amazing. A female monarch can find milkweed plants that are an inch tall. I did not know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just by sense of smell, they can smell the milkweeds and then they land on it and then they lay an egg. Oh, my gosh. But it's really a miracle. The cedars are being removed and they're being burned, and then you have this emergence of seeds that have possibly laid dormant for 25 to 30 years. That's the glory of burning. Is it a monarch? <laughs> Sam, Sam, come here. I'll keep him up here. You go oh, look there at there it goes. Oh, yeah. We've just found a monarch. She's been landing on these purple flowers over here. This is the kind of plant that uh, we'd like to get a little more of out in the landscape provide food for uh, adult monarchs. Look over this way, we've got quite the display. In this part of Oklahoma, this might be just about perfect monarch habitat. They've got a plant that they can lay their eggs on so that the caterpillars will be able to survive. And then the female could fly a few inches over here and nectar on these flowers. This is moss verbena. And believe it or not, an egg that is laid today will become a adult butterfly in about 28 days. This was heavily cedared, and so whenever we let that fire, it was extremely hot. You can see on one of the hillsides where it looked like it, it just nuked it. <laughs> this plants that you're seeing growing up here now is an old seed bank that was here. And so we get the flowering plants, and then eventually it progresses into the native grasses. Uh, it's obviously had great effects. I have to be honest, before coming here today, I wasn't sure how effective cedar removal would be for 
restoring monarch habitat. And uh, I've seen with my own eyes how areas that were treated with a bulldozer and then a prescribed fire was applied, and now that's some of the best monarch habitat I have ever seen, loaded with milkweeds and nectar sources. For every 100 monarch eggs laid, only one of them gets to become an adult. The other 99 get eaten by predators and parasites. It is a dangerous world out there. Now, that's why it's important for us to have a lot of habitat to keep the life cycle going. The positive impacts are, are present. The whole plan's coming together. It takes everybody working together to help get that done. For a species that's declining, if we can bump their numbers, even in this little corner in southeast Oklahoma, I love it. Scientists are still studying how evolution works. How do animals adapt to environmental changes? At White Sands in New Mexico, a fairly new environment, plants and animals have had to go through some contortions to survive there, so it's a good place to study. More now from Miles O'Brien in our Science Nation report. It's 6 a.m. and Bree Rosenblum and her team are headed out to do some fishing. So some people just use a simple slip knot but I like the slip knot in the slip knot. But don't let the sand dunes or the fishing poles fool you. This is no beach. This is the desert. Do you want to get a GPS point over here too? Yeah. With support from the National Science Foundation, biologists from the University of California, Berkeley, are here at the White Sands National Monument in New Mexico to study evolution in action. These little lizards have a story to tell us about how new species form. Hey, 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 hey! Hey! Hang on, hang on. We're interested in the big questions in biology, and it's also exciting in this time when our world is changing really rapidly, and we want to know um, whether and how and when animals are gonna be able to adapt to environmental changes. They come to White Sands because it's an evolutionary hotbed. The 275 square mile gypsum dune field formed very recently, geologically speaking, only about 10,000 years ago or so. All of the animals that colonized this area had to go through an incredible amount of change in order to live in this unique environment. And so what we see is that a lot of the animals have evolved a number of different adaptations to survive here. The most noticeable one is that they're all incredibly light in color. These are whiptails, just one of the lizards they study. They're the same species, but may well be diverging into two. The little guy on the left was caught right here on the dunes. And you see that the White Sands one is a lot lighter in color than the one from down the road. You can also see that its stripes on its back are much fainter. The team also studies lizards in nearby transitional zones where white sand gradually gives way to brown. These so-called fence lizards are climbers. They like trees and running along ridges. We measure what color they are. We measure different aspects of their body size. Um, we measure what they're eating. And they take a tissue sample, usually a little section from the tip of the tail, back to the lab for genetic analysis. The same gene that is involved in the color difference in these lizards is also a gene that's involved in um, color variation even in humans. Rosenblum says lighter colored lizards clearly have a better shot than darker ones at living long enough on the white sands to breed and pass on genes. They even select mates based on color. It's incredibly important for them to be camouflaged in their environment because they are out looking for their food and looking to find mates and doing all the things that lizards do during the day. And at the same time, their predators are out looking for food and all the things the predators do during the day. Love you, puppy. She says understanding the process of evolution is important given the large number of species facing extinction around the world today. Some of them won't make it, but some will, in part by adapting quickly, a lot like these lizards. So how can, in this time where things are changing so rapidly, how can we give species the best chance possible at survival? And part of that story is evolution. It has to be evolution. The world's changing too quickly for species to survive without evolving. Sunset and twilight. All in all, a good day's fishing for these folks, even though they only caught little ones. Now here's a quick look at stories from our next show. 
we were afraid. We were just scared to death because it sounded as if it was taking the roof off. We have water in places we've never had water before. For centuries, people have lived on ocean shores, but sea level rise is threatening millions on the East Coast. Lots of communities are taking action. The local governments here all get it. People are getting wet enough, they want solutions. You can't walk away from it. So the issue is, how do you fix it? How do you live with it? How do you deal with the problem that we've got? Hiding, putting themselves in places where they're close to burrows, where they can quickly escape from predators, that's really important. Listen up. Tracking collars on these pygmy rabbits help scientists understand their sagebrush habitat. So we're here at the Sweetwater Rocks, right. uh, which is a segment of the Granite Mountains. There can be a real sense of wonder and awe and freedom just for that hour, two hours, five hours, whatever you have, when you get to wander out here, you, your mind gets to roam as much as your feet. And it's, it's just truly special. Learn about history or make your own on Wyoming's public lands. It's these little bits of land are these snapshots, sort of time capsules of landscapes. You know, what we see here is probably what it looked like 50 years ago, 100 years ago, which is what's so unique about these places in Wyoming. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on This American Land. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org and like us on Facebook.